Hi everyone, good morning. And a warm welcome to all of you all for the 20th edition of Textile Rate. I'm Priyanka George, I'm from AWS and I'm going to be your host for today. And really great to see all of you all on a Saturday morning over here. Um, the topic that we're going to discuss today is on Gen AI. Let's talk Gen AI is what we're going to go through towards today. today. Just to throw some numbers at you, you know, based on what our research companies are saying, some of the consultancies are saying, to show you, you know, the kind of relevance that Gen AI has today. Um, so according to Gartner, by 2026, more than 80% of enterprises would have in some way or form used Gen AI, APIs, models, applications in production environment, which is going to go up from 5% in 2023. 2026, 80%. Um, within the first few months of the technology, McKinsey had already estimated that it has the potential to add around $4.4 trillion in uh, the uh, global economy, and this is annually. Lastly, uh, BCG states that 2024 is the year that we'll actually see tangible benefits from Gen AI. A lot of enterprises who are in their adoption journey are estimating productivity gains of around $1 billion. And we are already exploring new business models, business growth areas, where this money can be invested to grow our enterprises. So, you know, this just gives us a view as to how it's, you know, kind of caught the mind share attention um, across the globe, across industries, across different people. And I truly think we're at a very exciting uh, inflection point at the widespread adoption of ML. And it's something which is going to change the way we interact with customers, the way we do business going forward. So that's what we're going to dwell throughout the day. We have some, you know, speakers from Toyota Connected, from AWS side. We'll also have sessions, you know, to get inputs from your end. So please keep the questions flowing. Please share your thoughts, share your experiences. We want it to be an interactive session. So to start off with, I would like to call up uh, Pradeepa Ravindran. She's the Senior Director of People Operations at TCN. Request you to come share your thoughts and kick off the event for us. Thank you, Priya. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Toyota Connected India, we welcome you all for the 20th edition of our acceleration program. Um, as you know, Toyota Connected India is the subsidiary of Toyota Motor Corporation, and we are a team of engineers who build passionately products on the mobility solutions. Which means we 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 are creating safety, sustainable, and mobility solutions for our customers. So we proudly say, and in, in India, we are based out of Chennai and Bangalore, and we are a team of 300 plus software engineers, machine learning, and data scientists who have passion in driving innovation in the sustainable safety and connected services. So we proudly say this is our 20th edition of this acceleration meetup group. And this meetup group has around 2,000 members. And it's a very vibrant group. And we provide this platform for people, for, for a like-minded professional to come and share their experience, knowledge, and innovative ideas. So this meetup group is a very vibrant community. And one remarkable aspect of this meetup group is we covered a wide range of topics. This um, starting from emerging technology, programming languages, and very, very interesting technology subjects line. So I'm sure that this will have a very interesting um, takeaway for all, all the members in this forum. So and we managed to balance out from the beginner friendly sessions to a very tech intense advanced topic so that everybody has an amazing, get an amazing experience. So we welcome you all. Thanks so much for coming. And this is something that it's, uh, it's support for people who actually expand the technical expertise, build connections and valuable connections and network and stay ahead in the very, very, very evolving technology field. So thank you so much. Welcome you all. Thanks, Pradeepa. Um, so for our first speaker today is Ayush Neema. Ayush. So Ayush works as a senior ML engineer at Toyota Connected, 
very apt to this topic his interest lies in machine learning artificial intelligence and numerical optimization with his tenacity to learn ayush has worked in several verticals business applications of ml ranging from your classical ml to new age deep learning models along with several analytical approach and tools this is some of his knowledge that he's going to share today uh, the topic being multi agentic paradigm with langra hey folks good morning uh, i am ayush um i'm really nervous and uh, first of all thank you for coming here um, saturday mornings bad have extra gravity <laughs> it's very difficult to get up and come thank you again uh, today we will be discussing on uh, multi agentic ai uh, and we are going to discuss on one very specific tool known as uh, langraph uh, so uh, basically how many of you have uh, uh, worked on building any applications using uh, using any llms anybody what tools uh, have you used before langchain any other sorry lemon okay cool uh, so basically uh, this presentation is about uh, one specific tool known as langraph uh, it's a, a recent addition difficult okay so basically uh, langraph is a graphical approach so rather than mentioning table of content i am mentioning graph of content so basically we'll start with uh, general gen ai landscape this will be a very quick uh, go through uh, next we'll discuss on uh, uh, maturity of using large language model which is basically how do we engage with uh, large language models there are different levels like uh, the basic one to the elevated ones we'll discuss all of them uh, briefly then we'll go one layer deep uh, we'll discuss about uh, agentic ai we will define agents what are agents what are their roles and why they are in so much buzz uh, then we'll discuss a very popular tool uh, langchain and why is it uh, we are comparing it with langraph a new addition uh, we'll go uh, and understand graph and then finally langraph langraph there is no much uh, i mean slides we directly jump into demo uh, demonstration i have keep uh, i have uh, kept a three basic demo for ready uh, which uh, kind of brush you through basic uh, of langraph it will set you on the trajectory of learning langraph and then we'll finish by concluding remarks so uh, this is uh, gen ai landscape uh, i'm not going to yeah uh, basically i'm not going to discuss much about gen ai like what kind of models and all and what are the use cases most of us are at at this stage most of us are kind of knowledgeable or you are like you know what it is all about what i want uh, you to look at this uh, is this graph where it says there is a constant growth of gen ai uh, maybe it is uh, uh, about the application base it is the new models which are coming in so the thing is what we need is to equip ourselves with the correct set of tools right and i must say that uh, gen ai is a field which is severely understaffed uh, it, it needs people who know more about agents who know more about maturity i mean who can develop applications using uh, uh, a gen ai and trust me it is very highly paid as well because it is very new uh, initially i think in 2023 most of us have heard that there is a job known as prompt engineer how many of you have heard heard this correct no so now prompt engineering has become a very basic thing uh, now we have evolved in just in a course of one year itself okay so uh, we will learn about what maturity is since we know that okay we have to know about uh, uh, gen ai we have to know about uh, using large language model next thing what we do is we just define a arbitrary term known as maturity which tells us how we engage with a large language model okay so basically when we say it's a like a arbitrary metric and when we say a less mature it basically means a approach in which we don't even use much of the capability of a large language model it is like you have a diamond and you just use it like a table paper weight you don't use it properly correct and more mature means you are using the capabilities of large language model to the fullest okay so uh, we define this in uh, uh, six levels 
uh, starting from uh, basic prompting this is uh, uh, this is simple i mean you just uh, direct prompting essentially means you take a web console just like chat gpt you write your question and you get the response right you are not even using what large language model are supposed to do or what it can actually do at the full potential so this is direct pr uh, prompting which is the least of the maturing maturity about uh, large language model next come uh, prompt engineering this is uh, what the buzz all about uh, last year about the prompt engineering job and how far we have moved over a course of one year itself prompt engineering is, is still basic uh, i mean uh, b uh, based on the kind of application like summarization classification and all you write or you frame the prompt in a fashion that uh, it can do the job and it does the job well uh, we still use prompt engineering uh, like uh, several of these methods these are still uh, old ones we have still a long list of uh, new prompt engineering techniques coming in uh, today and then uh, uh, traditional nlp problems okay now these are the problems so maybe this is a short list uh, there is a longer list of the problems which we had the issues when we did not have the large language models we had uh, uh, libraries for doing machine translation we had libraries for speech recognition and sentiment analysis etc etc but now uh, how many of us actually know nltk existed like hardly like we used nltk in the era of large language models spacey hardly a lot a few people of us know so uh, this is about and this uh, things are just like a one prompt away from large language model if you want uh, named entity recognition or anything it is just a one prompt away from uh, using large language models but large language models are still way more capable than doing uh, these stuff right so next level next complexity level is custom chatbots uh, you would have seen a lot of uh, chatbots in chat gpt window like if you open there is a on the left side panel there is something known as custom uh, gpts where you can either upload your own or you can use the pre built uh, free options here like this also hugging face have these options but this is still not there okay we are still far from using the full fullest of uh, large language models now we come to a level where we need uh, developers this is our area okay basically rag is uh, you all know it's a retrieval augmented generation this is where we say that okay we do not want to settle with the existing knowledge of trained data of uh, large language models we want to use our own knowledge base it may be private information it may be i mean private office information it may be our own uh, wikipedia something some information right and it will uh, what we do is we use large language model here only for uh, augmenting the uh, response that we got from database so we are there but still one level below so the final thing here is what we call as agentic ai agentic ai is the term that comes from the agents agents are nothing but functions or the programs that uh, give uh, the workflow full understanding of its own self it kind of makes awareness about its own self it, it kind of brings life to the own workflow in which what happens is uh, if i just read the definition these are the auto, uh, autonomous systems or programs that can perceive their environment that is number 1 make decisions and take actions so these are very powerful because now we are at a level which give the autonomous autocracy uh, to uh, any large language models if you want if you want to develop any chatbot or probably any sophisticated dev, uh, application where uh, uh, it needs to check different things maybe wikipedia it needs to check uh, any uh, booking information it can just do it on its own so it is a sophisticated networks of uh, different large language models okay now uh, knowing that uh, agents are something next thing is to find the tools right it is like you found the gold mine but still you need shovels to dig it right so th those uh, shovels are uh, these are four main tools uh, which uh, i found uh, are uh, very useful uh, the first one is autogen uh, this is a product of microsoft research these are all four open source okay autogen has some steep learning curve involved so people prefer it maybe pre people use it but is not that much of a popular tool at the moment crew ai is gaining traction because it is simple to use still powerful but uh, and then 
a length chain, which most of us definitely know by this time. And then comes Langraph. So there was a small uh, developer survey which show which was like uh, uh, people mentioned different names and uh, Langraph still came on top because it is simple, it is powerful, it is very intuitive. Okay. Next thing is we discuss the tool. Uh, now the next thing comes is to know about Langraph in a nutshell. So Langraph is a tool which comes from the ecosystem of Langchain itself. Langchain, if you see the web page, they have three tools or three things mentioned. The first one is the Langchain itself, very popular. They recently got the first major release. Second one is Langraph, which is like a year old. Uh, you can see in this graph on the right uh, on the right side. And then there is a Langsmith. We will briefly touch on the Langsmith as a byproduct of learning Langraph. Then uh, uh, Langraph is uh, completely open source. It is MIT license. You can use it for commercial uses as well. It has got close to 6,000 stars and mostly written in Python, making it very easy to learn and debug as well. Right? You can literally go to ch uh, check the source code if you want. Then uh, if you look in this graph, you will find that it has got uh, more than 1 million downloads per month, making it one of the most downloaded uh, agentic AI tool of the time, at least now. Uh, okay, so now uh, Langraph is fine, but the question is why should I choose Langraph? Because Langchain is fine, we are comfortable using Langchain. Then why do I uh, learn something new which is not that much of worth, if at all? That's the question, right? So the, uh, I will compare a few things here so that uh, we know why to choose uh, Langraph as a tool. The first one is the state. So uh, I'll explain this more in the next slide, but basically state is uh, uh, information at this moment. Okay, suppose you have a workflow which is running and uh, what happens at this moment, you have to register some information, right? You should know what is happening in the entire workflow, but uh, uh, Langchain is stateless. Essentially, if you fire a, a workflow, whatever is happening now will be known but what has happened, there is no information about it. What is about to happen, no information about it. It is just like fire and forget. You start, it's like a function, just one by one by one it will happen. Langraph on the other hand is natively stateful. Essentially, when you start to run a workflow, it knows what is happening and what has happened in the past. So it logs the messages on its own by default. Obviously you can add memory to Langchain, but this is the default feature of the uh, Langraph. In Langraph, you can make uh, either the stateless system or the stateful. Both are options open to you. Then comes uh, the type of use cases. Langchain is very good for a simple task. Simple basically means like a simple uh, workflow. You do this, then you do this, then you do this, like pipeline kind of workflow. Or probably uh, you do this, then you do this, and then you choose which one to which branch to go like conditional it is good for it there is no doubt about it but the problem is it cannot uh, do complex tasks and what complexity i will discuss now length graph uh, on the other hand is very much flexible it can also do a uh, sorry cyclical task what is cyclical task is like a feedback we will look more on the feedback in uh, coming slide uh, uh, then uh, as the number of agents increases in Langchain, the complexity increases and it becomes very, very difficult for Langchain to manage these tasks. However, Langgraph is meant for uh, more agents to be used, more tools to be used and more tool nodes to be used. For that, it is highly scalable. Okay, so number of tools that you use, number of agent you use does not affect the functionality of Langgraph at all. Then um, there is something known as tools. So agent uses some tools for uh, getting understanding of the environment. These tools are separated all, if you're using five tools, all the five tools have to be sep treated separately in Langchain. How <clears throat> However, these can be either treated individually in Langgraph or they can be clustered as a single tool node in our workflow, okay? So this is very powerful because now you have only one node to maintain rather than five different tools to individually take care of. Then obviously uh, there is no visualization in Langchain 
and uh, this is one of the very powerful feature of lang graph because now you can see the workflow by your own eyes you can check the flow i mean what is going to happen next at least you can check it okay now uh, after this com comparison at least i believe that you have some degree of conviction that uh, lang graph is superior at least to some degree than uh, lang chain okay next uh, so this is essentially lang chain universe which contain all the tools uh, all the agents uh, all different llm functionalities and this is lang graph and what uh, we are going to do is we are going on an exploration to learn little bit more about lang graph okay then uh, we will learn at least now we are in the stage of graph so uh, how many of you by show of hands can tell me that you have no you do you know about uh, graph as a data structure okay thank you so basically uh, this is a graph which is basically it shows the flow of information i mean from uh, node number n1 you go to n2 where it will make some decisions uh, based on some condition it and it will find out which node to pick next okay in uh, uh this n1 is the start node because this is and then n4 and n8 are end nodes okay and nodes when we say these are some agents in our lang graph context okay these have some kind of large language model sitting inside of it then the next thing to learn is uh, obviously the node that i mentioned is a uh, agent uh, uh, then there is this arrows arrows basically means edges and uh, in graph theory there is only one edge there is nothing like a conditional edge so conditional edge is a term for a term used in lang graph itself which basically means a node in which you have multiple choices to choose from okay and we will use this term conditional edge so kindly keep this in mind and then the power which is the is the cyclical behavior so basically let's say uh, you have some kind of system uh, i'll Uh, tell the name of this prompting later on but basically let's say you have a system in which uh, the n5 node generates some kind of response it's a llm it generates some kind of response but uh, you want a json so you need some validation happening outside so n6 let's say is a tool node okay it just checks the pydentic schema whether it is a node uh, it's a valid uh, json or not and then comes the n7 which so at this stage you have checked the data structure but you still you need to check the output is as per your requirement or not okay let's say the prompt is you want to write an essay about india and uh, you also want to mention the speciality of each state you want to mention the cuisine of each state and uh, you also want to find the population of each state so these things should be the part of the essay so the first n6 node will find whether it is a json output or not it it contain the relevance information or not n7 will find whether each content which you wanted in the prompt is there or not if not then it will again go to the n7 to n5 again in the cyclic behavior this kind of prompting is relatively not exactly new but uh, this is what we they, it has name it is known as actor critic prompting it is very powerful and it is absolutely useful when you want uh, output to be validated and check effect checked this is also known as meta prompting with some variation and this is also known as self reflection so this kind of behavior you cannot do in lang chain at least the native flavor of basic flavor of lang chain you cannot I cannot accomplish this so that's when we need uh, graph next thing is state so this is where the actual power of lang graph is realized state is essentially some information okay so basically the definition says that it is a shared data structure that represent the current snapshot so if your graph is stateless then it will only reflect the current state sorry current snapshot if you are building a stateful uh, kind of graph then it will reflect everything of now including all the previous things okay so uh, this is what the state is uh, we will know more about this in the demo itself and uh, oh yeah so this is now uh, we are in the demonstration uh, i'll show your sure. 
so uh, wait wait sure so the first, i have three demos which are like progressively increasing uh, in their uh, use cases the first one is what we are going to build a simple chatbot okay like a absolutely simple chatbot in which uh, the user will post a query llm will respond and we will get a response a very simple one but uh, what you are going to see is how do we build a like a uh, directly you will check how do you build these things in langraph we will use open source llm only we are not going to use like a chat gpt 3.5 turbo or any a paid model this is uh, uh, on the all three different uh, demonstration i have used the same open source model so that we can save on our learning cost okay and then uh, i will show you the logs which we built using langsmith okay so uh, we begin uh, by simply uh, installing the dependencies we install langsmith i'll show you what it is langgraph and langchain lang uh, grook uh, this grook here is the curation of open source models which are uh, free of cost but extremely powerful to use so this is how the grook uh, landing page looks like so if you check here th there is a long list of open source models so just like uh, uh, olama which uh, installs the model on your local machine it does not so it also saves the space of your machine very fast but obviously it has a caveat it uh, it has rate limits but that's okay i i believe uh, for personal learning rate limit should not be a big issue then uh, coming to your mod models uh, we first set up the environment variables. Uh, so in uh, our Google Collab, I hope uh, you know that we can set the environment variable just like this. Uh, so we call them uh, here, like user data dot get, group API call. This is our group API, and this is for Langsmith. Okay, and this is just setting up environment variable, and this is uh, Langs Langsmith is simply a place where you, you can log uh, the activity log of your uh, system. Uh, when I show you, I think it will become even better. Then uh, this place, we are simply using a LLM. We are invoking the chat group model and we are calling gamma two model, nine billion parameters. Okay. And we just check it whether it works or not. And it just works. Okay. It is just like one API call away from your responses. And then uh, this is here, you start building straight away directly into the central central part. We call these two things I want to take some time to explain uh, from typing import annotated and type dict. This, uh, these two things are required, very much required for building the state of your graph. Okay, so this is the state. This is the information that will pass from node to node if you are having multiple nodes. And we just defined one state, like one state, uh, parameter here known as messages in messages you call the annotated list and add messages now this add message is a core functionality of langraph what it does is uh, it uh, kind of appends the messages automatically so for example in a workflow you have 15 different nodes so it will keep on automatically up if you are going from one node to another node to next node it will keep on adding the messages from each things in coming demo, we will also see how to customize this thing even further. And then uh, you define a function known as chatbot, which is simply uh, here, uh, you're invoking uh, state messages. I mean, this is from here, this message you're invoking here. And uh, this is it up till here. Now what you do, you, uh, I think I forgot to mention this. So this is the state graph. In this line here itself, it will create an empty slate of the graph. I mean, up till here, you might be having a lot of functionalities, but it will create an empty canvas for you. And now in this canvas, you have to start drawing, which is here. You add a node, which is, uh, you call that node as a chatbot. You can, this is a string. You can anyways mention anything here, but make sure that uh, this name is consistent because you have to call these names in several locations downstream task. And then you just say add edge. Edge is the same arrow which I mentioned in the anatomy slide. 
and then you from the start start is a default parameter it comes from the lang graph itself start and end you start uh, from start it goes to chatbot from chatbot it goes to end correct simple and then you compile it bingo that's it now when you visualize it it comes like this very simple and straight powerful and now uh, if you want to do something you just run it here and it will keep on asking you the question. You ping it and you get the response. The in-between task you can at the moment ignore. This is the total response from the AI and the blue message is from the assistant. Okay, and uh, you can just ask anything. And if you want to quit, just write here. Since we have given it like uh, three parameters to quit the model, it otherwise the cell will keep on running as you can see here. You can ask endless question. This is still accepting the, uh, like it is responding from the knowledge it already have, right? There is no other, like this is the state information directly from LLM, Gamma 2 model. And if you want to quit, we just quit and it says goodbye and that's it, the uh, model has ended now. So this is the first demo. It's a small one, but uh, still good enough to give you the insights on how you build things. The second one, The second one, uh, we'll go just one level deep. We say that, okay, LLM knowledge is fine, but we want to use some tools. Tools is essentially something which uh, give the additional knowledge to your graph, just like reg. Okay, so, but this is from open internet rather than uh, uh, your pr private documents. So what you will learn is we will, this time we will define a conditional edges. We will define two tools in here. One is from the archive XGG, which is, uh, I think oh, research paper uh, archives, okay, open source. And the second one is Wikipedia. And we will give uh, our model intelligence to find out which tool to pick. Since these are uh, uh, tools directly from the LangChain, uh, we are calling this uh, use of pre-built tools, okay? However, you can build your custom tools and agents here in LangGraph. Then uh, uh, we will bind these uh, tools to LLM so that uh, LLM knows what all functionality it, it has got and then functional calling itself. So we, oh, oh I, I forgot to show the length graph. Probably I'll show this after this one. So uh, we come back to the second demo where uh, you again uh, installed the dependencies, same length graph, length smith, length chain, and length group. This is all installation, setting up the environment variable connecting with the group model and again starting, but this time with a twist. So uh, what we are doing is we are in, uh, calling for uh, uh, different wrappers and tools. Now this wrapper will become our tools. I mean, if you want to access uh, archive uh, paper, we will call the archive tool. If you want to use some information from Wikipedia, it will access from the Wikipedia tool itself. And then uh, we have to install Wikipedia and this thing is coming directly from LangChain community. Now, so uh, Pi, uh, this Lang graph is completely integrated with uh, LangChain. So whatever LangChain has to offer it, we can directly import it here without any hassle. And then uh, you just set up the tools, which is very simple. You simply call the archive uh, API wrapper, and then same thing with Wikipedia. And then this is this place is critical where you will call LLM with tools. So up till here, uh, in the previous call we had seen, in the previous demo we have seen that we are using LLM.invoke, or maybe I will show you here, but this is where you bind the tools here. So whatever number of tools you have, you can simply bind it here, and then you just test them. So you just say archive tool.invoke generative AI. So this is, it will pull some information, some, since we have given maximum number of top K results is two, it will bring the top two results about some research papers, which is like, this paper is weak AI and this is something else. And then we can also test for our uh, uh, Wikipedia tool. So it simply brings some weak information. So it works, right? So now our tools do work, but still we have to integrate with our existing uh, Lang graph nodes. So next thing is again, defining the state, which we did previously, and it should not be very new to you now. And then we create an empty canvas of graph. Okay, and then uh, you create uh, the chatbot again as the previous one, but this time you will use uh, LLM with tools and not LLMs alone. And then uh, we define the execution flow just like we did previously. 
and when we visualize the graph it is here little different than previous one because we are having the tool notes this time and now you can simply ask uh, uh, tell me about nikola tesla and then it picks automatically uh, i wanted to tell more about the conditional edges but uh, probably the time is up so i'll rush a little bit here uh, so you define it and this kind of thing is what we call as react agents so automatically reasons and act so uh, when you ask the question human message ai says that which tool to call wikipedia automatically here and then what arguments uh, is the nikola tesla so it will now go to wikipedia tool with the argument uh, nikola tesla it will fetch some information and get you there then same thing we will write a query for testing our archive agent we'll write that tell me a short summary of something and then it uh, human message ai message it again finds the archive tool to use with a query and then it brings the tool messages and then this information the tool message will go to ai message fetch the information rephrase it and show you as the ai message as a final response and then uh, this one is a, a good one because uh, here i will show you that it also reasons multiple times rather than just once so uh, here you ask that tell me about lord krishna and janmashtami so what it does it first find that it is a wikipedia tool and a query is janmashtami it finds some information and then again goes to tool uh, tool node and again fetches some information on a different parameter here and then it automatically recursion recursion is happening which is not possible in langchain at least so this can be even better and then uh, we go to the third one quickly in which uh, we will use rag now rather than tool i mean along with the tool of wiki we are using a rag rag agent so uh, if we go to here uh, again we will install a few things and this time i am using a extra db for uh, rag rag application you can use anything like pinecone chroma anything but extra is what i am preferring here Now uh, you can go to Astra page, get your uh, applic uh, application token and DB ID, and that's how you connect with it. Uh, I'm for Reg. I'm just using some lil log uh, uh, articles, three articles from that page, um, and then uh, split that thing. And there are total ninety three articles from that one, and then you generate the embeddings. I'm using a free model which has three eighty four dimensions for each vector it generates. Then you create the vector store. add those things uh, so this is where you are adding uh, uh, all the vectors to the database and you can also use the same uh, uh, variable as a, a retriever so when you retrieve uh, like explain threat model so it fetches from there you see multiple results here which are very similar because i ran the same thing several times so it has same vectors in the uh, same vector in that database again like repeated several times so it is same things but it will come as a single one if you do it one time or if you don't add uh, uh, several times then uh, you build the application but this time the thing is you cannot uh, uh, allow large language model to choose any node i mean it has to for node selection the if if condition is very strict like if the output is this then do this else do this so that uh, condition name should be very strictly monitored right so we mention that the output of that llm should be or must be either vector store name or wiki search like very rigidly nothing else no case change no no any alterations just like that as it is so we define a route query then we define again llm the same thing which we did and when we test the router this is uh, how we test a router we are binding the route prompt with a structured llm router and when you test it Uh, it gives the output like a wiki source sorry if you are asking about who was abdul kalam it will give you that it is a wiki search query this is a llm response instead of giving a longer thing now it is just giving me one thing that what it, it belongs to and then you just uh, install wikipedia again give it a test run build the functionality and uh, i'll jump for here now and this is how the graph looks like uh, look like now it has a vector store okay so when you ask questions now it will uh, uh, for example i am asking who who is agent so uh, you see that it says the route question is a function that is running then it goes to rag it fetches some information uh, from the rag and it shows me the output okay so i did not do not have enough time to show this in detail but uh, at least i'll 
uh, quickly uh, as a concluding remark, I'll show that uh, Langchain and Langgraph, the combination, open source combination is a truly masterpiece. Yes, there are problems, there are bugs, but they are very fast resolving. Like if you're following the Langchain community, you will know uh, there are bugs uh, and they are closing like 100 bugs or more than that issues in a single day, which is crazy. And then uh, if you are building this for any commercial application, you have to be mindful because up till uh, October of the last year, like one year back, there were severe uh, level security bugs of the remote code execution. So you have to be mindful if you are using this for a commercial application, do a security check once. And then uh, a few tips uh, from the experimentation that I had conducted is you can use a large language model in a single workflow. If you want, uh, for example, uh, if there is rag, if rag is not a part of it, then there is no problem. You can use open source plus combination of a premium models altogether. And then uh, the functional calling, uh, I noticed that the local model, especially which are a part of Olama, are not properly supported. They have a lot of issues in functional calling. That's why I'm using Grook, and Grook works pretty good. Foo, thank you. So these are few concepts that probably you can learn if you want to learn uh, Langgraph in detail. And uh, here is QR code, if at all. Uh, it's not even minimizing. Sure. Thank you. If you have any questions, probably you can ask it out now. Yeah, please. Yeah, you can set the limit. So uh, I have seen a graph uh, up in which they set the five recursion limits. But the problem is five means it will, uh, especially when they do this. Uh, uh, research agents in which uh, they, you give the topic and the, it will research on the research papers and the open articles and blog, then uh, you can set this limit to be high, like 10 or something. But every time you're losing cost in uh, uh, scraping and like rephrasing the information using uh, LLMs, but this is in your hand is what I want to say. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes uh, when uh, uh, when I'm manually prompting, I used to say like, please forgive this context, give me a new uh, uh, new answer. So how it, it does does it handle that or it yeah. always keeps? So uh, they have a concept. Uh, if you know, uh, in my slide I was showing, or maybe I can just quickly go. Yeah, here. So basically, the place where we compile the workflow, uh, there is another argument known as checkpoints, which is not used here, but I can give checkpoint as memory. Then uh, if suppose you want to continue this, this application here is not storing any context. So in the first one, if you say that, okay, hi, my name is Ayush. And the next one you ask, what is my name? It will not be able to answer, but you can save it. But if at all, there is something known as time travel in which, uh, for example, if you're continuing with one kind of information, switch to something else, but still want to go to the first information, it can still go that. And also there is another option. If you want uh, uh, the information to be changed that uh, in one thread, you want to have uh, maybe some other discussion in another, another one, then you can configure threads. They have argument of uh, config equals to thread. You can mention that as well. Thanks a lot. It was really great. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, hello. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so basically uh, there are two types of tool here. Yeah, in the tools, so one is the pre-built tools. So if you check the custom tools, so in the doc string of that tool, no, you can write a description about what that tool is all about. And when uh, uh, the LLM is skimming through the tool selection, it will check the doc string alone. It does not check anything else. So 
uh, suppose if uh, one tool is uh, about scraping information from some particular website, if the uh, description is not enough, it will fail badly. But if the description is good enough, it will enter that uh, particular uh, tool. Yeah, for more. Yeah, 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 there is. So basically what, uh, uh, like I have seen one probably, oops. So basically here, uh, this one uh, is one example here. So for uh, what they mention is, uh, if the tool count is more than five or six, no, you have to choose decentralize the stuff. Because decentralized means uh, rather than one Oracle here, like if you see this part, Oracle and it is connected with some nodes here. So a single node or single agent should not handle more than five or six tools at a time because it will try to miss I mean, uh, misclassify the tool selection in that case. Then you can uh, decentralize, have multiple tools, like a cascading or hierarchical kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have they are connected with different tools, but this is a uh, uh, agent here. Uh, I can explain you this offline. It's a proper project of its own. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is a tool essentially for, uh, so basically you can load number of arguments to it. So I'm using a very vanilla flavor of uh, archive. Here, so basically this uh, archive tool, uh, it's a wrapper. I mean, it is just a scraper kind of thing. So it has access to a lot of like, I think more than one lakh or two lakh different research papers. However, you can again uh, edit this. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it's an inbuilt tool, but you can have your own for further scraping if you want. And to improve my productivity, I'm going How much inputs can I give? Like this custom or already fed data? No, this is just a wrapper to scrape it. I mean, it does, if you check uh, other source code, no, it does check from open source itself. So if there is a paper which got uploaded just yesterday, if you're asking about it, it will be able to do that. It is just a search. It is not a LLM call. These are tools which are just doing some stuff. When you can have a tool for addition. This is just a tool. To Make it basically tokenize those data. Or... Yeah, I, I have to read about it. How does it work internally? But this is scraping. Yeah. Okay. How much feasible would it be to run all this in a local environment uh, instead of, you know, say, like you said, uh, Astro DB? or uh, this lang um, the whatever code you're running it in Google Colab. So is it possible to actually do it in a local PC, like a normal PC or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, as long as uh, LLM, if at all you want a small quantized model in your local, then it will cost something. But I, I if I, if you, uh, here I mentioned that there is a problem with the Olama. I mean, if you, Yeah. Frameworks to integrate. Oh, yes. I forgot to show that. It is visible now. The UI framework is uh, Langraph is now coming up with something known as Langraph Studio. You can directly do everything on, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, 
लोकल मशीन बट एट द मोमेंट इट ऑनली सपोर्ट्स एप्पल मशीन आई मीन यू कैन डाउनलोड द डी एम जी फाइल इन लोकल एंड इंस्टॉल इट इट सब इट हैज कंप्लीट वेब इंटरफेस यू डोंट हैव टू आई मीन डू एनी थिंग जस्ट ड्रैक ड्रॉप क्रिएट राइट मैसेजेस गिव सम इन्वायरमेंट वेरिएबल एंड इट विल डू दॉ it has uh, but at, this is in the early stage but it is a revolutionary because now you can build graph application just on uh, uh, local machine itself lang lang flow i know but never used uh, so sure 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 yeah then you can probably try lang flow in that case but this thing is coming it's very good uh, i know about this one i tried this once i do use lang flow but like i'm asking this output we are getting like uh, that output we are getting how do i integrate with like a web page or sort of things that time instead that... of going to coding is there any framework like that uh, i know two things one is this one and uh, other than that uh, the second one is lang uh, smith but this is not exactly a ui framework this is full log the information uh, you can just check in a uh, quick succession i will just show because the time is up but uh, it shows everything like how many tokens have been used the time even the flow of uh, information i mean if i pull this here so you can check uh, what happened when which call went everything is just here i mean what was the query what is how it proceeded what is the output everything is here this is one good thing you can integrate with your uh, front end but front end i think it can be either streamlit based or react something but there is nothing out of the box from here <laughs> any questions uh hello everyone good morning Uh, so i had a doubt with uh, software development life cycle here so i have this template set up so our, my team has to create uh, like custom wrappers and uh, adapters for uh, like kind of tools for this uh, this lang graph so that whenever uh, something new uh, let's say new data source i want to look at i just have to go and create a tool for it connected it with it and uh, i have to, i can use this so that's how it works in the software development like yeah 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 so. every other functionality the adapter that you are mentioning can become a tool here uh -huh. and then tool can be called now tool can also be a logging agent in which you can log information or okay. it can be a uh, information passing agent which tells them state information and pass it to front end or something okay so in the in the example like we have gone through a use case but is there like lang graph has some testing uh, frameworks built in where each stages we can run like pre configured test so that it checks all the like this uh, question i have the user ask this question this should be the output something like that it is built in for each agent uh, no i did not get it completely sorry no uh, so uh, so uh, i i just want to check for, uh, check the accuracy of the output of the agents yeah 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 so, in that case uh... uh you can have uh, either pydentic schema there or uh, you can also have this kind of thing uh, yeah this uh, self reflecting agents okay. you can check either the response as well and also the schema output i mean in fact uh, in this case uh, we had defined uh, something if you uh, if i open it here yeah here so the place where we are defining the state here so we are uh, it is a typed dict type i mean the state is a typed dict type uh -huh. so it only accepts of uh, information in a list format even in the state any node that you create it will uh, the input has to be state that is number 1 so by default the pydentic schema is cascading from the top level to the down one plus you can enforce any schema in any tools anyways we are using uh, i think several places we are using pident uh, from langchain uh, pidentic v1 import something something okay yeah thank you sure um, probably i'll close now thank you
Thanks, Ayush. That was a great session, and I think the demos really got the subject to life. And everyone, Ayush is over here. We have certain breakout sessions and all, so please feel free to interact, ask more questions. You know, let the conversations keep flowing. Um. So next, we have a speaker from AWS. We have uh, Central Vale Palraj joining us. So Vail is a senior solution architect with AWS. He manages the telecom business across India, SARC, Sri Lanka regions in their AWS journey. He's got a rich experience working with enterprises across the globe, working on their digital transformation, their cloud migration, their AIML adoption, as well as their DevOps journey. Vail has spent over a decade in the US. He's built modern solutions using microservices um, and serverless architecture. He's also helped using um, build solutions with uh, CICD and MLOps, which has actually led organizations bring their products to the market much faster. Taking too much time, we'll over to you. He's going to cover a bit about Gen AI on AWS. And as usual, please keep the session interactive. Hi everyone. Hope you can hear me. It's a good crowd. Thanks for coming on Saturday. Now my laptop, just in case. So once again, my name is uh, Vail Palraj. I'm a senior solution architect from AWS. I'm based out of Chennai. Um, I handle few accounts, mainly telecom, media, and entertainment segment. Um, I've been in the space on the machine learning from 2018 or so, when um, we were only talking about you know uh, building machine learning models for predictions, forecasting, and a lot of other things, but now Gen AI is um, changed the game. Um, so still, while everyone is trying to change, everyone is trying to say everything is a Gen AI. Still, there is a traditional ML, and then there is a Gen AI. So we should know when to use what. So today focuses on Gen AI, but um, just a factor of uh, matter of the fact, the traditional ML still is relevant. If there is some use case like binary classification and image classification, a lot of other things, you will still be using you know, traditional machine learning, while Gen AI is still part of the overall machine learning umbrella. All right, so I think we, you had a really good session on Langchain and Langcroft. It's a good segue to the this session because you learn the different concepts, right? How to build an advanced Gen AI application uh, using Langchain. And in fact, I did a very great job introducing you to the next advanced tool, which is Langcroft make it easy to build complex you know, workflows within Gen AI. Um, so I'm going to focus more on the AWS side and what is our offering and how it can help you. And, and what we are going to learn today is, is basically answer to these three top questions, right? As we talk to our customers, uh, first of all, our focus is more on the enterprise. While there are many applications available that you can use, like ChatGPT, Claude, and Gemini, is for the end customers, right? For consumers, we focus on enterprise. Uh, whatever we build is keeping enterprise in mind, the security, and then the scale that is needed. So, as we talk to our customers, what we hear from them is, you know, um, 
as they seen so many models out there in the market, especially in the last year or so, you heard, you heard I think you might have heard multiple uh, providers offering multiple models and every three months or four months, we are seeing new models coming into the market with a different you know, uh, token size. You might have heard million sub token, now billion sub token, I think very soon it will be trillion sub token. You might wonder who's going to host it, what is the cost, right? Um, what about the security? So that's another question. The very important question is, even if I build an application, how am I going to, you know, move to production quickly with the security and then the responsibility AI in mind? So these are the three questions um, that we are going to address. While addressing it, I'll try to um, explain the services and how you, how you can use it to you know build uh, uh, an advanced uh, Gen AI application on AWS. I can see if it works. So, how many of you heard about Bedrock? Okay, very few. How many of you worked on AWS before? Uh, quite a lot of fans. Um, how many of you built an Gen A application using any platform like open source? That's a very few number. So um, I think you know a little bit basics. And in the last session, you learned about some of the ways to build application. I think this is more of a level 200, 300, uh, but I'll try to explain the basics if at all needed. So Petrak is our service uh, for generative AI. Uh, how many of you heard SageMaker by any chance before? Okay, that's a great number of fans. So SageMaker has been there for quite some time, and SageMaker is our machine learning platform where you can build any sort of machine learning models. In fact, some of the LLMs are built on top of SageMaker. The LLMs that we are going to use, LLMs, some LLMs that are in the market is actually built on SageMaker because SageMaker provides the platform, the infrastructure, and then the tools to build any sort of machine learning model, including a large language model. But I don't know how many of you, how many of us can build a large language model. As you know, it's in the cost of millions of dollars, right? Building a ML model. So Bedrock is our service for Gen AI. There are a few things we are offering. First is we are offering a uh, wide variety of models. I'll show you the different models. When I say models, the foundation models, right, are the large language models used interchangeably. At the end, these are all Gen AI models. And we also offer model customization. Uh, while you can use any model and build a uh, Gen AI application, but sometimes for, or many times for enterprise, you need customization because it may not understand all the things about the the segment that you operate, for example, Toyota Connected, you you know more about the connectivity, the automobile industry than any other. Uh, um, the model knowing just you know learning from the open source or internet data, so that in that case, you may want to do model customization. The second thing, rack uh, retrieval augmented generation is more if the model doesn't understand like. Um, your data, then you can feed in your data to augment the model response. In simple terms, to make it more relevant, I think Ayush talked about Rack as well. And the top thing is the agents, which is the hot topic now, uh, because the LLM can't do by itself. Uh, it can't do a lot of things by itself. It, it needs an agent um, as well as a Rack system so that it really works for your use case, right? Very, very, very important one, the security and privacy is is the is the top reason why we have Bedrock as a service. And we built Bedrock from the ground up, keeping the security uh, in mind. In the sense, uh, we do not store any of your data. We do not keep your data or use your data, your enterprise data to, um, to train these models, right? You know, LLMs, is nothing without the data set, right? They pretty pretty much crawl whole internet, 
that's how they train these models but we do not store or use your data set for the training so you may feel a little overwhelmed if you look at the number of models um, in the market on bedrock this is the list of models we have um, so let me try to make it simple for you you are all working for enterprise is there any students here by any sense okay that's good you have we have good number of students also um so for enterprise i think you will be um so you will be more focusing on the anthropic models models coming from anthropic which is a third party model provider and then the stability ai based on the use case so Anthropic is really advanced, and then especially their uh, Claude 3 uh, family, the uh, version 3 family is really advanced. And especially you want to remember uh, Sonnet and Haiku, these models is the one probably you will end up testing it and probably you will end up using it in production. So these, we categorized it based on the different use case. Um, all these models pretty much uh, does, you know, really works well with the text and um, the anthropic models of the latest ones actually works really well with uh, image also. It is not meant to generate image, it is meant to understand the image. So it's a vision uh, models. But if you are into, you know, marketing and if you want to generate images, then you can go for uh, stability.ai. So they offer these, uh, stable diffusion models that you can use for you know generating um, images from text all right so let's do a little bit deep dive uh, stability.ai so first of all these models the we we don't build these models right we host these models um, as you know the large language models it takes a lot of compute uh, to train the model at the same time you still need a lot of compute to serve these models. So you cannot go and post model on your laptop. Or maybe if you have a few servers, it's not going to be you know, sufficient enough to host these models. So that's where we come as a platform provider. We host these models and we make it easy to access these models as an API, right? You don't need to worry about anything. You just call the API. It is a single API. You just change the model name. You can pretty much access any of these models, and you pay per the use, right? So, if it is a you know text models, you will be paying based on the number of tokens that you are consuming. So, when it comes to stability.ai, I think if you are into really uh, creating a lot of images, you know, uh, for example, you can take a one just one single picture of a new car that you are launching. And if you want to generate image that the same picture being the same car being in the Himalayas or in a city or in a dirt road, you can actually generate these images. You don't, you don't, you, you, you no longer need to go and shoot all these images in different places. Just an example I'm saying. So for that, you can actually use a stable image ultra, which is a enterprise grade uh, LLM that can really help you to generate very advanced images. And then we have large and then, and then core. The ultra is little on the expensive side because it is meant for advanced use cases. So now coming to the most uh, important model or the one that you will probably start using and end up using it in production as well. It's from Anthropic. And uh, we have three, four models here. I would recommend you start with the Haiku. Haiku is the, the fastest and the cheapest model. You can see the cost you see on the bottom, right? It is per thousand token. Um, so if you even use a million token, it I think it's going to come less than a dollar. But if you go to the advanced model, which is going to be uh, Opus, it's a little expensive, but it has more context and more you know intelligence than uh, the other models. I think 3.5 Sonnet is the uh, very recent announcement, and this is more, it, it's a little more advanced than the Sonnet, but um, I would recommend you start with Haiku. And if you think 
uh, you need little more reasoning or intelligence, you may switch to Sonnet. And the context window is very important thing. All of them are around 200 uh, K context window. I think that's more than enough to uh, parse a document and give a relevant response. And all of them supports uh, vision in the, in the sense you can just upload an image and you can um, um, you can get an insight from the image, right? All right, so now we have the foundation models and um, I think I just talked about prompt engineering, which is fancy word for asking a right question to get the right response, but it can get complex. If you don't know what to ask, the foundation model is not going to really respond um, you know, with the right answer, right? So prompt engineering is all about, you take the foundation model based on the use case, you give some relevant input. For example, you can give even examples. This is how I want the response. And the foundation model will, will understand and then it will give you a response. I would say up to, I think about 70 to 80%, you can get things done just with the prompt engineering. So don't underestimate the prompt engineering. You can do a lot of things just with prompt engineering. But what about if you want more relevant answer. The next answer is the rack, the retrieval augment generation, right? If if the if your data set is not available on open source, sorry, on the internet, it's a good news. It's only with you. So that means the foundation model is not going to know about it. And the foundation models are mostly trained till certain amount of date, right? If you look at Sonnet, if you ask uh, anything about that the new product that Toyota launched in 2024, it may not know because it is trained till 2023. But if you want, if you are building a customer assistant chatbot, and if you if your customer asks you want to further feed in with the new data, then you can use a rack to supplement that additional data set. It's basically your enterprise data set as a in a private and secure manner. You can feed in that additional data set, and the foundational model will use it augment it, and then present it to the user. But what about you have a, when you say, if you say you have a very advanced use case and you need to teach the foundation model to know about your domain, and this is very relevant, and we have seen <clears throat> publishing companies like uh, many of the news media, uh, insurance companies, and tax uh, filing agencies, they do go and they do fine tuning. Do you know why? It is because they have huge corpus of data, which is only they know, um, you know about their domain really well, right? So they go and fine tune it and, and then they make that model just for themselves so that the foundation model really responds with the right, you know, set of answers. The other option is uh, continued pre-training. The difference between fine tuning and continuous pre-training is the type of data that you are going to use. Uh, but remember, I should highlight the upper arrow. If you noticed, the more you go on the right side, the cost is going to go up, the complexity and the time you're going to spend. That's why you should always start with prompt engineering. I have personally worked on with a few customers. We recently uh, implemented customer care assistant for one of the telecom company, and we were able to do just with the prompt and rack. Um, we we can save a lot of you know dollars just using prompt and rack. But if you have to do fine tuning and continued pre training, the the difference is like I said, fine tuning is little simpler compared to continued pre training because. In fine tuning, you might have huge data set which are labeled, and then you can just feed in and change the weights, and you'll get a better model. But continued pre-training, it's pretty much you take the the weightage from the uh, foundation model, and then you feed in the data, and then you might run it multiple iteration. That when you use fine tuning is more, you know, just to increase the accuracy with the labeled data set. You can go for fine tuning, but if you want to 
build an LLM just for your domain with more data set, then I think continued pre-training is going to be the answer. And if at all you want to go for a fine tuning, Bedrock is the only managed service that can make it easy to do it. Just look at it. You can take Claude 3 and you can bring in your labeled data set. And then just a few, few clicks of a button, you can change the epochs, batch size, and then the learning rate. You can actually go ahead and run it and you'll get a you know, custom model, which is again hosted on Bedrock. Here you are not provisioning any infrastructure. We take care of it behind the scenes and we do not store the data again. We do not use your data set uh, to further improve Haiku. The, the Haiku model that you are fine tuning is going to be private. The data set you created or the data set that you used is going to be private. So we basically create a separate account to you know, create a fine tuned model and then host it just for you. So when, when you host the Haiku model after fine tuning, you are the only one you know, will be using it. It, it won't be available to the public. Any questions so far? Um, so, see, you are building on top of Haiku, right? Which is a still it's a proprietary model. So. I don't know how you will be using that weight, where you will be. But Haiku won't be available yet. You, you need that foundation model still to use the weight. You are not um, downloading the old weights, right? Um, see, we, we do host a Llama which is a open source model. So to be accurate, the open source is uh, used maybe not so appropriately. It's basically an open weighted model, not an open source model, right? Open source means you can go and download the source code, but none of the LLM is gonna give you the code. So you are basically downloading, basically using the open weight, and then you can further use the weight that you 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 used your data set to train it. So for but for Haiku, I think um I don't I don't see an option if that's going to be viable. All right, so now you just learned about there are different models and which one to use and what is the right technique to use it when you want to go to you know build up DNA application. Now we are going to get into a little further. Um, now the focus is just take an assumption that you decided um, to build it on Bedrock. You decided maybe Claude Haiku is the best option to start with. Now, how can I actually go and build a use case? I think for every industry, there are multiple use cases, but the one best use case that I have seen apply to every single customer, every single industry segment is the customer care assistant. At the end, you offer a product or service, and then the customer has to you know, you will have a call center, you will be responding to the customer, right? I think the customer care assistant powered by Jene is the best use case. That is the use case pretty much every single customer is uh, building. Other than, you know, you can actually build your own HR chatbot or internal document chatbot or internal API chatbot. Wherever you see a corpus of documents, you can put a Jene on top of it and make it easy for your, you know, customers or internal, internal employees to go and use it, right? So let's keep customer care assistant as your use case to make it easy for you to understand. So now what we are going to do is we need to do prompt engineering. We talked about it. So to, while prompt engineering is simple to do it, but it can get complex in the sense you will end up having hundreds of prompts because if you, uh, in my case, right, take a telecom industry, uh, you all use a mobile phone. You all would have talked to your uh, mobile provider you complained about your phone, connection, data speed, and many things, right? So let's take as an example. For a telecom company, they need to have, they need to support multiple queries coming from customers and they need to test all these prompts if they have to build a you know assistant. So what we came up is we came up with the option to 
manage your prompts. You can actually, you know, if you can read this, you can write a prompt. Um, so you are a customer service analyst. You are a customer care assistant or something. Always respond in a, you know, bracket language of a user uh, and in format, uh, you know, these are the two variables. So what we are achieving this is you can actually write multiple test cases and then you can test it with the different models, different, you know, uh, the parameters. I hope you and you know the different parameters comes with pretty much every single foundation model. The temperature is the one if you pump it all the way to, you know, one, it is going to be more creative. Sometimes it will hallucinate or most of the time it might hallucinate. But if you bring it to zero, it is going to be very prescriptive. Sometimes it may it may say, I don't know, right? So you have to balance it and then top P, top K, these are all different metrics you want to adjust it. So while you figure out the prompt, you still need to experiment with the different, you know, parameters coming from LLM. And also you need to experiment with the different language. For example, in India, we have so many languages. You want to support multiple languages. Then, you know, in fact, Claude uh, Sonnet 3.5 is really a good model and we are doing some sort of testing for our customers. We've seen really doing good job for many of the languages, including Hindi, Tamil, Telugu. Experimenting in any of the customer care assistant, definitely try 3.5 Sonnet with uh, multi-language support. So what prompt management, what we are doing is we will make it easy for you to store all the prompts and we'll give you variables to test multiple, you know, uh, you know parameters that you want to test it. So that's prompt management, and again you can do it on the console or you can do it as an API. The next one is, I think this might look a little bit relevant on, little bit similar what you've seen in the last session, right? Um, um, a flow chart. So once you have the prompt, what is the next step? So the prompt is basically is going to call a foundation model and then the foundation model is going to call either a rack or it's going to execute a certain function. So we wanted to make it simpler. So what we have done, for example, if you created 10 different prompts, now you want to build a complex workflow, right? For example, when you call a, a telecom company with a, I lost my phone, right? There simply terminate your connection. They might ask you to check or provide your PIN number to validate you are the customer, which phone you are using, and there, there will be multiple steps they need to do, right? So that is the complex workflow. So for that, what we can do, we can use the prompt flow with a simple drag and drop. You can actually track the prompt, and then you can use condition either uh, if else condition, or you can even put a Lambda function, which is our serverless function. With that, you can pretty much write any business logic, and then you can bring in the bedrock agent, which I will cover in the next, next slide. You can also put a knowledge base, which is our rack offering. I will cover that in the next slide. And then you can orchestrate this whole uh, you know, workflow, which is very similar or somewhat similar to what you learned in the last uh, session. You can do this again on the console or you can do it as a API as well. Wanna like the power actually. Apologies here. All right. So knowledge base. So all these are different features within Bedrock. Bedrock is our service, like I mentioned. Knowledge base is a name for, uh, you know, creating a rack system. And everything that we do is is to make it easy for enterprise, secure. So that means you are not going to create any uh, any of the infrastructure behind the scene. We do it. So knowledge base is basically if you have a data set, if you have it on your enterprise, um, you know, store or if you have it in an S3 bucket, if you already as AWS customer, you can actually use it as a data store, and then we will create a rack system for you. Um, and recently what we have done with the rack is, um, what we have understood, many customers, they have different types of data, right? You have different data 
format like PDFs, images, documents, and then um, you wanted a better accuracy when the data is coming from PDFs and you they wanted a different strategy. So what we have released very recently is we support multiple chunking uh, strategies. Chunking is a way to you know, split your documents into multiple you know, chunks, as it says. But when you split, what is the strategy that you are going to use is actually going to change the accuracy of the response, which means, right, if you have a document and if you have hundreds of documents and if none of the documents is relevant, uh, then you don't need to combine these chunks together, right? So you will chunk it differently. But if 10 documents are talking about the same product, you may want to use a chunking strategy like hierarchical chunking, which means it will chunk it in a, you know, it will split these, but it will have a relationship. So, you know, if you understand behind the scene, in any rack system, there will be a vector database. So we will take your document, we will create a vector and then store it as a vector. And and then the when when the foundation model goes and checks it, it will get uh, it will do a semantic search on the vector database and it will, it will get the relevant response. So that's how it works. And the another important feature that we released is a parsing strategy. For example, if you have a PDF document and if you have your product catalog and if you have, for example, the different cars, uh, the different variant and then the different you know, benefits uh, the variant offers, the parsing is actually again powered by a foundation model, which you can use it out of the box. What it will do, using foundation model, it will go and understand your PDF. For example, if you have the table like the one I said, it will understand the different, you know, characteristics, characteristics, and then the fields with it, which is in the in the table itself. So what is going to make a difference is the response is going to be more accurate. Like I said, again, we focus enterprise customer. If you have, I think some of you might be already using SharePoint or Salesforce or Confluence. Um, so we give you a plugin, uh, just a simple plugin. You can actually connect knowledge base to your data source, which means you don't need to bring the data again or duplicate again on another system just to build a rack. And we are expanding to more uh, you know, data sources as well. And again, you can use a web crawler. You now, if you want to connect to data dot uh, com, you can actually do that as well. Uh, like I said, the engine behind a knowledge base or a rack system is a vector database. And on AWS, uh, I think in the previous session, you learned about a different open source databases, but we do support open search. Um, if you already have your data on open search, you can use it as a vector database. We also support, you know, um, semantic search across these different databases. Uh, if you are already using any of these databases, you don't need to do any extra work. You can just point your knowledge base to these uh, uh, databases and start using it. <clears throat> so what we have learned so far is you created a prompt, you created a rack, um, and then in the rack, you pointed uh, the rack to your uh, data sources. So now the foundation model can understand the internal data set and it can understand some uh, some more additional detail about the products that you are offering. But this is really good if you if you create a customer care assistant, you know if you if your customer asks, hey, how many uh, you know what type of cars you offer in the SUV segment? It is a basic you know response you are going to get. But what if you want to build a customer care assistant or a let's say more than a customer care assistant, you want to build a sales assistant. If you want to enable your customer to buy cars on, on their WhatsApp or in your mobile app, then it has to execute certain actions, right? I don't know, people will buy cars like few lakhs in, in the chat. They would probably go meet a salesperson and buy it. But um, if you really wanted to make it easy to buy a car, if you want to do that, then what you will do is you need to execute few APIs behind the scene. You may want to check the inventory. You may want to check um, the credit score of the customer or certain things you want to do right before you go and place an order. For that, um, I mean, just I'm thinking even if you don't want to place a 
um, you, even if you don't want to buy a car, maybe you can make it easy for customers to uh, pre-order cars, right? If here we need to you know, pre-order cars because there is a lot of wait times. So in that case, you may need to do, you may need to call certain APIs, the APIs that you already have it internal. Um, so for that, agents is the answer. Anywhere you need to do more than FAQ, agent is the answer. So what agent does is it will take the input coming from the user, uh, for example, going back to the telecom use case, right? Uh, I type it saying that uh, my prepaid connection is not working. It is a very simple statement, right? If you call the customer care agent, he will go and check multiple system to check when you say your prepaid connection is not working. He will check whether you have balance, whether you know you are the right customer, you have the balance, and then he will check multiple network status and things, right? What the agent can do is it can do all these things automatically because of the foundation model it is you know powering behind the scene so what the foundation model really doing well here is it will take that simple um, question coming from the customer it will break down into you know multiple tasks the customer is complaining about prepaid connection so i have to check these three four five things in this order and then i will respond back in this whole thing, the agent will do all the breakdown of the customer question into different intents and then calling APIs. It will do automatically. You are not doing any programming, which is a really good thing, right? That's the power we are getting from the foundation model. So, so what you will do is you will just say, um, I'm create, what, how you will create an agent is you will just say that I'm creating, creating an application uh, for a customer care assistant and you need to do certain things and then the agent will create prompts behind the scene and in fact you can edit it if you want to make it more advanced but it's all done behind the scene automatically all you need to do is you will select the foundation model you will provide the basic instruction and then you will select the different data sources and then you will for the actions you will specify lambda functions where and how you want to execute those api calls which is really powerful, right? So I'm gonna very quickly cover a few important updates that came very recently. We also support code interpretation, which means put a sales document and ask the agent to summarize it, what it will do. It will create a code uh, based on the, you know, the question that you are asking. It will create a code, in fact, and show you the code. And we execute it securely behind the scene and we, uh, give you a response, which is more advanced feature. And the other thing is, um, the bedrock can do a memory retention. I think in the last session, there was a mention about keeping a memory, right? So that when the customer talks, initiates a conversation, and if, if he comes back after a week or so, the chatbot will remember what he asked, who's that customer, what was his complaint, which is very important. If you want to really give a good customer experience, the memory retention can keep customer session up to 30 days so that you can give a better response. The other important thing is guard rights. This is this is the most important thing I would say. If you are if you are building really enterprise grade application, you do want to protect your application against um, you know like a SQL injection. We have a new term called prompt injection. I, actually, hackers can. Um, to a misuse of your application using you know prompt injection so that's something we can filter out we can filter out specific topics uh, harmful topics harmful words all these we can filter it on top of the foundation model even the foundation model are tend to avoid certain topics and bias but still uh, you know it's not going to be 100 percent so that's why we give you guardrails you can use it for any models whether you use it agent or not this is a, like a filter you apply on top of it. It is very simple to use. You select what is the topics you want to avoid, and then it will do it for you. And it can actually filter out any PAI data before it sends it to the customer. And again, it can handle hallucination as well, which is a you know thing that is there with every foundation model. The top, but not the least, like I said, security is the, the first um, primary factor we decided uh, 
was the influence to build Bedrock because no customer want to leave their data to the foundation model. So we keep your data secure. We do not use your data. We, when we even, you know, gen, build a custom model, we, you know, do it in a separate account and just to use it for your purpose. So your data is always secure on Bedrock. We never ever use it for any model retraining purpose. And uh, we do, uh, you know, Bedrock also complies with some of the um, compliance and security framework if you have to, you know, compliance to these as well. <clears throat> How do you get started? We have a really good demo. I wanted to show you a demo, but couldn't make it possible today. But if you search uh, Bedrock Retail Agent, there is a uh, GitHub repository. You can actually go ahead and deploy it in the AWS account. You will have a fully working Bedrock agent for a, a sample use case called ordering shoe. You will see how they have done a prompt engineering. Uh, the whole thing, you can see it and practice it. In I would say in a couple of days, you will be expert in using Bedrock agent, using Rack, uh, and you can use that a similar code for your uh, you know, enterprise use case. So, and there are certain, you can uh, take a picture of this. This will be very useful to, you know, to get started with that. Thank you so much. Um, I want to open it for FAQ. Okay. Hope I have a few minutes left. Any questions? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, so, so I come from a background of FinOps. Sorry? I come from a background from uh, Cloud FinOps. So we manage a cloud environment for uh, enterprises. We are tasked to optimize their cloud spend. Yeah. So in the, in the year of uh, like Gen AI or the LLM models, everybody want to do uh, Gen apps. Um, so these, these pricing tiers are based on tokens, right? Uh, so uh, like we are kind of struggling where uh, to figure out a way to optimize or understand which is which tokens are necessary, which is not necessary, so that the transparency layer is not there in even uh, in other um, uh, like uh, like Azure or OpenAI also. So we like is there AWS has any kind of a framework to understand which tokens are like kind of unnecessarily spent for ident identifying it and uh, optimizing like optimizing the workflows. Uh, which is for the whole AWS spend or just for the Gen AI related? Just for the Gen AI, because uh, let's say uh, I have easy, I can look at the performance and say like this is underutilized and all. For the Gen AI apps, it uses like let's say uh, it uses a million tokens. Like how can I like figure out and say like this is 50% of the token is unnecessary or this uh, fine tuning is not necessary? How is there a way to differentiate those kind of things? Yeah, it's a really good question. So that's the Typical phase, uh, the experimentation experimentation phase is where you are in trying to understand, you know, what is the right model and what is the right amount of prompt, what is the right dollar value for the use case, right? Yeah. So, see, while experimenting, you would ideally start with, like I said, choose the lowest model, the least expensive model, so that if the model really intelligent enough, you don't need to go further. Second, initially you might run a lot of prompts, right? I hope everyone understands the token, right? The token is few characters. That's how they measure it. Um, so we charge you per thousand input, thousand output token. So if you dump the whole document, then you are getting charged. So initially what you need to do is while experimenting, it's fine. You will, you know, you see it and then measure how the uh, response is. Later, when you want to go to production, you definitely need to look at it and see, does it really make sense to, you know, keep this much up? There isn't any tool that is going to tell you, um, you know, you are actually using too much prompts than what is required. So that's why I would say, while some of these tools meant to replace are meant to uh, replace certain roles, but it is not completely going to replace everything right it is that's why you need human intervention and supervision in every stage of gen AI application development so if you want to really control the cost you need to look at how many um, tokens is used 
for this particular application and what is the budget you allocated and see is there a way to optimize it but most likely you will you will end up in deciding is is this model really um, um, is the right model for your use case is it possible to lower the cost by going to a different or lower model second look at all the prompts and see if you can reduce the the input token size and with the bedrock agent you can actually limit a lot of uh, you know input token yeah so yeah so right now like we are also kind of moving into agentic model like uh, like connecting multiple agents the get data verify the data so these agents like they talk more yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we are trying to control the spend on spending tokens yeah I, i'm happy to spend time with you i think you are a little bit progressed on the experimentation yeah. i i seen this with many of our customer there are ways to optimize it i can you know explain um, there are uh, bedrock agent does a lot of things right because it, it it gives you reasoning why it is thinking why it is calling this api while doing it it will sometime you know give you more information than what is required that means that's more output token that means more cost so that you can actually in short you can turn off the pre processing um you can actually go and edit the advanced prompt and reduce the prompt it is actually injecting you know in every single call we can do that actually okay thank you sir all right yeah hi i am into a full stack development uh, project uh, where uh, we have we are building a chat bot right now so in that we have a it is a medical kind of uh, application medical related application we have a set of document which uh, we we can able to give it uh, you said right uh, you, we can upload a document which can be uh, re- uh, into the the thro- uh, rock and uh, it can able to understand and yeah. can able to respond right so is that possible right yeah yes. so the first one is this the second one is uh, uh, we have a database with uh, multiple uh, in a mongodb uh, mm-hmm. collection with multiple schemas and uh, we have to limit uh, only sp- set of uh, schemas can be accessed by the right. uh, chatbot and uh, only the readable actions like uh, for example uh, there is a payment methods and payment status as well so we don't want to read the payment methods but we can able to know the payment status whether the payment is succeeded or not so this kind of access can be limited so is this possible in this um so mongodb we do have compatible version on aws so uh, it is possible of course we support multiple database uh, both rds i mean relational and non relational so we should be able to help you you know in architecting this solution it is it is a common pattern like if you want to keep the data in the same database and you want to give only role level access yes. that is possible but we need to do a little bit customization you know, based on the use case but it is possible okay. we can connect uh, offline yeah, sure i think we got 5 minutes sir okay. any other question and a little uh, uh, the final phase that's like your model that is the only inference engine or do you have an inference engine even in your bedrock also when you read the knowledge base so knowledge base behind the scene you understand it's a vector yeah, database it's a, it's a so we do the semantic search yeah. and then we give that response back to a foundation model okay the foundation model will understand what is the response coming from and it will augment it and because it knows the question right it will augment and then respond back so in any stage the agent or the knowledge base it, it will feed the information the foundation model is the engine okay. to understand and respond back okay so that is that's why it's genai application right ah, so no, everywhere sure. we will be using foundation model so the actual one was like do you have a conflicting set in the knowledge base conflicting conflicting set so it's something like uh, you know your knowledge base has like there's a task there's mm. suppose a particular in user input and your knowledge base is not proper mm. the, let's say so you have like you can 
it's either like if you're doing a semantic search so there's a possibility that it could have been rule 2 but you actually found rule 1 and you processed it so that means the bedrock should be having something so the see. conflict of information is um, your knowledge base has yeah, different information base, than the yeah. foundation model right no 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 the knowledge base is like i'm sure it's like a documents a yeah, yeah. Number, large number of documents so let's say it's a you uh, like your uh, prepaid example for the telecom so uh, it's let's say that uh, there are uh, it's either two things that's gone wrong over here so the any rule based system if you take it it'll actually choose like if yeah. you do a semantic search it's going to say probably this is wrong but there could be multiple wrong happening actually so I mean, so i i'll put it uh, you know the question i don't know if you all heard um, see again if you have a incorrect information in your enterprise data set um, we should really sit and work on the data set right yeah. because that is the source of truth yes, you should remember when you use a rack uh, with the bedrock agent or you know when you use a foundation model with the rack um, the response will come the foundation model will not respond to the question it will actually directly go to the knowledge base you are it will use only the enterprise data set that you linked because that is more, more relevant information right only if it doesn't find information there then the foundation model will try to answer it by itself but what his question is what if you have a incorrect information in the data set um, or in the knowledge base which is which is bad on us right we shouldn't be providing incorrect data set because the foundation model is not going to really know wh whether it is a right or wrong it can't tell that we, we shouldn't rely on a llm to tell what is right or wrong except for few facts even for enter for but for enterprise customers we should always you should be the one deciding what is right or wrong so so see data strategy is not going to change because of gen ai we we for last five ten years i worked with so many customers um on building data platform bringing all the data and making data you know um, integrity and um, you know all these things is not going to change the gen ai application or machine learning application that you are going to build as good as your data if your data is messed up the response is going to be really bad so really focus on the data i thank hope you. i answered yeah, yeah all right thank you Thanks, Phil. I mean, I've seen this deck a lot of times, but every time there's something new I learn. Um, we'll go for a short 10 minute break. Um, you can pick up coffee from here. We also have folks from AWS, apart from Vail, we have people from TCI. And so please, you know, feel free to connect with them. You know, any questions, queries, let's make that interactive. So thus, coming back, our next session is going to be a panel discussion of fireside chat. Um, we have a couple of questions for our panel, but we'll also open it up for all of y'all. So feel free, you know, to ask any of your queries, questions that you have. Um, so I'd like to call upon Vail, if you can join us. Yush and Vail on the panel. In addition, we also have Aarti with us. Aarti, hi. So Aarti has over 13 years of experience in big data, machine learning, and backend technologies like Java and Golang. She has worked across diverse areas such as data analytics, search engine optimization, product development, and MLOps with AWS Lambda. Her particular interests lie in natural language processing with a focus on summarization, large language models, and text analytics. Thanks, Aarti, for joining us. So uh, let's start with a little bit of a fun question, you know, get to the serious business later on. So, you know, I, I saw this meme that says that, you know, AI is kind of taking up, you know, creating art and all these interesting creative work for us, while all the mundane activities of cleaning, washing is still left to us. So if I had to ask you here, and Aarti, why don't you go first? If there's one mundane activity of yours that you would want, you know, AI to take over, which one that would be and probably why? 
Okay. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, I would like to do uh, AI to do laundry and cooking as well, but I think it's not that advanced right now. But uh, at least it's helping me nowadays in certain things like uh, storytelling to my kids. And I have two boys, and they ask crazy stuff for stories. Uh, that's like mammoths, dinosaurs, for which I can't find storybooks on. So this WhatsApp has this meta AI. And I ask, give me a bedtime story on mammoths or dinosaurs. It gives me an instant story, which I read out to them, or I ask them to read themselves, if you're interested. So that was one mundane thing. But on, the, on a serious note, I feel in India, at least with respect to the electricity side, uh, people do have power cuts nowadays, and it's, uh, it's not predictable. And why don't we use Gen AI for that? We have this power grids and everything, the data coming in from there, uh, how much demand, how much is the forecast. In spite of all these, we have those power failures. So why can't we use Gen AI and use those data to predict uh, if there's a scheduled power cut or if this is going to create a power cut with this type of data? So that is one thing I feel which will ease everyone's lives. Thanks, Aarti. Are you sure to you? Uh, I don't have a mundane example though, but the outputs are mundane. I'll tell you what. So basically, <laughs> what I wanted to do uh, is uh, uh, based on an image, uh, animation, like em like video generation from an image. It is already, there are some models, but uh, uh, let me ask you, uh, how many of you have seen uh, uh, the 2021 video of Will Smith eating noodles or spaghetti? <laughs> have you seen, right? It's very creepy. And how many of you have seen a recent video of a gymnastics, uh, like a gymnastic doing athletics? It is again very creepy. So that new video has become a Turing test for uh, video generation. So if you know, like if you can see that video, it is like a person who is flipping and then automatically his body turns into two legs. So it has four legs now, no body. And then uh, it has become very difficult. So what I would want is, uh, or for example, the same example, which uh, Aarti gave some simple extension to it. For example, uh, a caricature or a, uh, a figure drawn by kids can become a video. You can just give a small prompt saying that, okay, uh, make this cartoon uh, venture into a green fields or somewhere, and then it can do on its own. But at the moment, it is uh, still we are uh, some far from it, is what I believe. So I think it's more on the fun side. I think we are going to talk about a lot of use cases. Um, on the day-to-day -day thing that I would like Gen AI to really resolve, I think all of you would be struggling with this issue, I guess. Um, I get at least three to five spam calls every single day. Is anyone doesn't get spam call here? You will be really, really lucky. Um, I, I think Atel is rolling out something, but I would uh, expect Gen AI to really not just detect the spam call, but explain to the other person in a language that they really understand that I'm not really interested in that product. How many times you call, I'm not going to buy it, especially term insurance. I don't know. What is the term insurance has to do with um, marketing? Same company, 100 times you explain. Next day, they will call. It will be a different person. If you tell them that I told, sorry, sir, I'm not that person. So, so it will be the same conversation. So I would say this is a top use case um, for Gen AI. I can totally relate to that. I just clicked on an ad for a real estate today morning and now I have 10 brokers calling me up, like even now. So I'd love that. <laughs> Moving on, um, you know, as technology leaders, you all would have seen multiple breakthroughs across technology innovations. So any fun instances or any memorable technology change that you saw, you know, in your career span, something similar to Jenny, I, you know, that you'll want to talk about. Ayush, why don't you go first? So uh, I relate uh, back in 2012 uh, when I was doing my BTEC. Um, it was the time when uh, around the same year, like 30th of September 2012, when uh, AlexNet came. And uh, it immediately became a sensation because uh, I think I personally believe that laid the cornerstone of modern tech and also modern computation. 
that uh, three crazy guys from uh, I think Stanford uh, joined together and participated in an image net uh, competition for recognition. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, this, they, they secured the first place, obviously, the LXNet model. The second model was 10.8% uh, more error rate. So this was crazy good. So personally, I believe uh, that was breakthrough moment for me. And after that, uh, uh, I noticed that the curriculum started including neural networks all of a sudden. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, uh, almost the same uh, period, probably a few years ahead, uh, 14, 15, uh, I was like, uh, working on content management and stuff. And I had an opportunity to move into big data. And the first application I started was uh, converting an uh, entirely a SaaS-based uh, product into a, a big data thing. And it was different and it was, it was like a total generational change at that time. So people were opening up, they were ready to use open source even in service-based companies at that point of time. So the analysis which I did at that point of time was uh, for a retailer in the US, find or predict the understock and the overstock stores and how do we distribute them. Uh, so this was a pretty SaaS based application which was routine for them, but they want to move away from their uh, cost savings and other things as usual. And they did adopt uh, big data eventually. So which was a big success uh, in there. So that, it was memorable to me. I learned a lot. I also understood how things are changing. So that I felt was a generational shift at that point of time. If I can add it, uh, I have multiple things, but uh, the top one is the cloud compute. What I would uh, say is a big shift in in the whole industry. In fact. Um, if you say, you know, I, I can, we can say cloud computing is the reason we have uh, Gen AI, because Gen AI is not possible without, um, of course, the data set. We need an internet scale data set, but to really train that kind of model, you need hyperscalers like AWS or other providers, right? You need that much compute. So I think cloud computing did really change the industry. In fact, uh, um, I, I, I got an opportunity to switch my career and then help me to change my career as well. Thank you. Very interesting insights from all three of you all. We'll, I'll start with you this time and let's move back to the topic of the day, Gen AI. So we've seen Gen AI, you know, disrupting across multiple industries and you being at AWS have you across, um, what would be you know, if you could give us some of the use cases where we see generate uh, Gen AI actually disrupting existing business models, bringing about a new way of interacting with customers, something which is, you know, completely changed. If you could give so us this is the most important question, I would say. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier. Gen AI is not answer for everything, right? There are certain use cases. Of course, Gen AI is going to do it really well. And then certain use cases, the traditional machine learning model is going to do very efficiently, very cost effectively. So we should know when to use Gen AI, when to use traditional ML. So now coming to when to use Gen AI. I work with multiple customers. Like I said, I mainly focus on telecom customers, India, Sri Lanka, and a few other markets. What we have seen initially when the Gen AI came, we had like 15, 20 use cases. In that, the few use cases that really went into production are prioritized. What customer felt is really useful for their end customer is customer care assistant, right? Pretty much every single customer has to deal with customer um, queries and cons to improve the customer satisfaction. So customer care assistant powered by Gen A is a truly revolutionary because earlier it used to be a rule-based engine, right? It can only solve certain or answer certain questions, do certain things, not, it cannot answer, it cannot understand pretty much everything customer is going to say. But now it's truly revolutionary because the foundation model can understand and execute complex, you know, workflow based on understanding multiple intents. And the other important use cases is a personalized marketing and sales. 
um, like I said, you can generate different images just with the base image, and you can generate personalized um, marketing emails, right? If you put in a Gen AI or LLM and then you feed in different customer data, and you can pretty much generate you know thousands of um, uh, I mean personalized content for thousands of users in few minutes, and then you can send it over the night. That's truly revolutionary, right? If you want to really give an offer to a customer, if it is relevant to that customer based on the product they are really interested, I think they are going to go and buy it. Like that, we have so many use cases, but for internal, I think since you, some of you worked at a large enterprise, if you look at internal use case, if you have HR documents, if you have large corpus of you know wiki, um, you know APA documents, you should you know, add a layer on top of it using foundation model. Um, so that is another top use case. Every enterprise is looking into it. Many of my customers they went and productionized it. Um, so this list goes on. I would say you know start with customer care assistant, personalized marketing, sales. And then you can, you know, in the automat automotive sector, you can um, improve your supply chain as well as um, you can improve the product design as well. Those are all very advanced use cases. Aarti, Ayush. Um, if you can tell us, you know, you all being from the automotive domain, being so close to the business, any innovative use cases that you all see specific to automotive? Okay, uh, so this is not related to any particular company, but this is just what I've read across uh, past few months and years. So people are slowly adopting Gen AI, and uh, so the top of the uh, who who adopted the most are Tesla and BMW. So Tesla, as we all know, they use the autonomous driving vehicles and everything. So the one advantage with Tesla is they use real world driving data sets. Uh, whereas uh, we know Waymo from Google, uh, they kind of substitute with synthetic sometimes and sometimes it's real world. So that is one of the innovative use cases. But then uh, BMW is a bit more advanced in the sense they use it in the manufacturing lines also, wherein many people haven't moved on to the manufacturing lines. So all we are looking at when we look at a car and say, I want Gen AI in it, yeah, please put a voice assistant in there. Let's talk to it and everything. But thinking beyond that, there is a car manufacturing process where there are a lot of bottlenecks. How do we ma manage the production lines efficiently? Uh, do we look at the demand and do it properly or not? So BMW, they have this... Uh, car production system communication systems, which is with Gen AI, where the car in the production line, when they're trying to fit in a part or, you know, a sort of a small part in the vehicle, they automatically interact with the production system. So the production system is another automated system. So, and, you know, if you have a vision model there and say, I'm trying to put this part in here and facing some difficulty, the machine is automatically or able to communicate with another system. And it says, see, this is not happening properly. And immediately, people can come in and rectify it. So the human comes in the loop after that. So this is one step ahead, which I feel BMW has adopted something new. And probably it will percolate to the different automotives in future. But uh, they are currently ahead. And it's somewhat innovative, which they do, apart from the usual conversational AI stuff. Hi, folks. Uh, I'll try to give examples from either what I have done or uh, I know of closely. So uh, how a Gen AI is affecting automotive industry. One of those examples is development of physics-informed machine learning, in which uh, you can do vehicle design with generative AI because uh, generative AI has got this reasoning which is uh, rarely found in the classical models that we know of. So uh, new models are now coming up in which uh, uh, you can reason with the design. So I worked in one such project in which you produce the sh silhouette of a, like you present a silhouette of a car from some perspective, like a side view or something. And then you request the uh, model to present, like a generate a car design from that. So that is uh, still kind of a new evolving tech. The second one uh, uh, is uh, the call center. That is really, really important because uh, 
as an automotive uh, automotive company we get a lot of like we have a call center in which we get a lot of different calls for different categories maybe because uh, they want to ask about subscription maybe people want to ask about uh, or maybe they have encountered an accident so there is a collision uh, happened and then they want to notify the call center for any help and all so now uh, gen ai is very helpful because we are developing tech around uh, this to automate a lot of things uh, around it and then uh, the third one is personalized advertisement so based on what you user does in a car uh, anyways we have can data and all we can make use of it for personalized advertisement not uh, kind of poking the customer too many times uh, like a spam uh, calls but still uh, uh, generating images probably generating content on what uh, they have seen or doing probably if they are interested for uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, car parts so we can generate a poster or something on the go and then present to them that is, uh, and a lot of these projects I've worked uh, in person, so uh, I know of this, yeah. Thank you. And if any of you all want to discuss these use cases with Ayu, Shati, Vail, please, you know, feel free after we are done with the session. Um, so another important topic with related to all of us uh, consumers of AI is responsible AI. So I want to understand from you, and Vail, you can go first. How can organizations develop a governance framework which kind of balances out the innovation and the risks involved with AI? Yeah, so security and responsible AI is, is super important. You are not, no one is going to deploy it without addressing these, right? So hallucination is, is going to be there. It's been there. Um, how do we address hallucination? Basically, you know, well as making incorrect um, prediction or information. Um, plus, your end customers are the users will try to abuse the system. How are we going to protect your application? So all this will come under, you know, um, security and responsible AI. Uh, I think we talked about the guardrails, which is which is our managed service. You you know, you apply. The guardrail with the specific topics, filtering, um, you know, bias detection, as well as PAI data removal. All this will help you to build a really enterprise-grade application. That is one thing. But at the end, please do remember, you do need a human supervision across the workflow because the industry is really evolving fast. You are getting models really fast. and you know, as you experiment with your use case, my suggestion is to, um, you know, look at every single workflow, every single stage from, you know, testing to pre-prod to production, have a human supervision with an accountability to check and filter out and then release a safer, you know, product to the market. That's what I would suggest. So as Vail said, uh, continuous auditing and monitoring would be the right path. But uh, but considering LLMs, why the other approach would be, so say we have fine-tuned a new LLM, I want to deploy it, but I want to test it properly. So say I have a sandbox environment where I deploy another LLM as a judge. So this LLM will try to jailbreak the other LLM. So what the human wants to do, the other LLM will be doing it. And say it gives us a report. See, I tested all these scenarios which will end up or which will be a jailbreaking scenario or which will be a failure or which will be a hacking uh, situation. So why don't we uh, do such things like, why don't we generate a report from an LLM, send it to a human, see, the, all these I tried out. Do you want to try in anything in addition to it? So. In my honest opinion, the best way to evaluate an LLM would be another LLM because that's how it would be able to bring down the system. That's what we want to do, right, with responsibly. How do we bring down the system? That's what an another LLM can do. And when it gives us see all this, it can be done. We can take counteractive measures and see what can be done about it. Most of the content got covered. Uh the same big problem hallucinations uh, i think uh, vale and arthi already told that uh, there are ways to deal with it but uh, 
uh, Hello Station had been there and probably they will still be there because these are generative models, uh, very ran random by nature. So uh, if you, uh, for example, if you're doing any classification job and uh, you get one kind of output now and then you try it a few more times and you get a different output again, completely different. So uh, I would say uh, setting up guardrails definitely is. Yes. There is an open source repo, by the way, known as uh, Guardrails AI. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, you can buckle up this thing even with Langchain or, or Langgraph for guardrails. You can use meta prompting or self reflecting agents for guardrailing again. Or, uh, uh, yeah, these two things uh, should be set up. And then also, I believe uh, there is a requirement of uh, uh, knowing the metrics. Uh, uh, there are uh, like a blue score or something, which if we are doing some tasks, we have to be rigid on uh, some metrics because of the generative nature. Uh, a lot of us do not know what are different ways of assessing our output of LLM. Uh, there are a, a bunch of it. I have uh, them in one of the document. Uh, so those uh, tests have to be done at least to ensure that the, at least in the sandbox before production or even before pre-prod, that uh, we are uh, in a right way, uh, send, uh, setting the right temperature, right top P content and all. Those things will uh, will be very, very important. Thank you. I'll open the floor now to everyone else. You know, anyone has any questions that you would want to put across to the panel? Uh, you are working with the uh, telecom uh, clients. So by any chance, Atel is uh, or any uh, telecom company in India. Or, uh, okay, let me see. Whenever I ask a question to the chatbot uh, to Atel, it uh, after two or three questions, it's tell me, please call the customer care. And this is the same experience with the HDFC chatbot, SBA, EVA or something. Like that. And after three questions, it says contact customer care. So are they still uh, in uh, development phase or... Uh, so that, that's a good question. I also share your frustration for, um, not exactly for the products or the companies you mentioned. Um, of course, I have seen it in my experience as well. Uh, and reaching a customer care agent, especially the human, now it is even more difficult. You know, you, you have to wait and if you even press nine, they, it won't connect, right? Because it's expensive connecting to a human. Um, so regardless of the company name, I would tell you if, if after a few questions, they ask you to connect to a customer care agent, it's basically a rule-based engine there. That's what they are running, I would assume. But that's where the um, Gene proposition coming really. It's, it can solve it because it it can do little more than what rule, a lot more than what rule-based engine can do because it can understand our sentiment. It can understand, you know, with a single question, it can understand multiple intents you know, what we are trying to ask and what it has to do. So at the end, the company has to use Gen AI to build that advanced assistant. It's not going to come out of the box. So that's that's the one of the most important use cases we are, I'm personally working, currently working uh, with one of my telecom customer to solve it. So, so just to understand the demand in Indian market, just to know because you are in that industry. Yes. So Indian uh, enterprises, are they moving towards that or it is, or like only... no, I, I've seen a lot of enterprise moving towards okay. are already in the progress of okay. testing, um, are enhancing their customer care assistant with the Gen A. That's yeah. what um, we are seeing across the globe, not just in India. Got it. Yeah. Thank in, you. Especially in APJ, we do have the language um, you know, problem, um, which actually getting addressed using the Sonnet 3.5, which is really good in understanding different languages, right? So now I don't see any big blocker, which we used to have six months or a year back. So if you want to build a customer care assistant with multi-language support, you do have tool set. You can actually go and build okay. it now. Thank you. Which is a good sign. Our customer care uh, it will be more efficient. And, and behind the scene, you know, every enterprise, they, they are not just trying to solve this with a chatbot, right? They also use Gen AI behind the scene to understand what are the different complaints that they are addressing and why, how we can prevent 
first of all right if there is a network outage they try to understand and they try to you know improve the service so that we don't even have to go and complain so they are using in both angle addressing the customer concern at the same time understand what is the customer concerns in a monthly basis or a weekly basis and then they try to improve the service so it is getting um, it's it's improving on both angles using uh, i'm using geo wifi uh, sometimes i got message uh, uh, we noted that there is a disruption in your connection we are working on it i was uh, amused i was amazed uh, Wow! So proactively, they are identifying that situation. They are fixing. After two, three times, uh, I noticed the pattern. If someone is switching off and uh, switching on the router, it generates an SMS message. There is an issue in your uh, network. We are actively fixing it. But it is just me switching it off and on. Just wanted. To... There is a flaw in the workflow. Right? They they need to know. Obviously, they can't know whether if you are switching it on and off. It's a human, but now you understand, right? The they can actually they have the data whether the router is switched on or off, which we are actually using in the workflow, right? The, the prepaid connection or the broadband connection. If you take the workflow that we are building, we not only check the network, we also check the router if the customer turned off it. Then we tell, hey, go and turn off the. No Wi-Fi router. That seems to be the problem, and which we have seen in certain workflow, certain customer do that. You know, not intentionally, but so. So this avoids a call to the contact center. At the end, that is the key. You are saving money and resolving the query faster. Thanks, Will. Ayush, Arthi, anything you all want to add to that? Um, any other question? I can see this slot is very quiet. Any question from you all? Uh, there's a lot of discussion regarding this Gen AI and its use cases for detective reasoning. So there are three types of reasoning, and we uh, the Gen AI when it goes to this deduction mode, they say it is not very, uh, you know, accurate kind of. Thing. So generally, if we see it somewhere around uh, um, cases like production or something like that. it needs a lot that the human element comes in because the human can deduct okay there's some event happening this has happened so this could possibly be the thing that is something which the gen ai is i believe is uh, there is a gap over there so how would um, you know when you are trying to replace a customer uh, service agent whatever he is the human actually can think about this thing relate to three events So, how are uh, you planning to address this kind of thing with your AI? Um, see, again, I'm going to go back to the telecom use case. Yes. Right. What we are actually working on is when a customer says there is a slow internet, we all tell, right? Yes. Hopefully, everyone would have called. But for a telecom company, they have to. Analyze multiple logs, right? The logs coming from the cell tower, logs coming from you know the. Also, they will use the logs from the customer information whether they have the right you know, plan and things. So what foundation model does is it will it will take all the data, and it will understand, and it can tell where things are going wrong. So foundation model has the capable to understand multiple you know logs to interpret and. right you know troubleshooting issue or a recommendation but if you say the foundation model has its own problem i think no one is is denying it it's going to have its own challenges it's going to hallucinate sometime it is going to uh, provide incorrect information that's where you need to while you're building this application you need to choose the right parameter right what is the right temperature what is the right prompt you need to use you need to provide examples right the use case i just mm, mentioned yes. i i would recommend providing an example when there is a um you know there is a network everything is good but the user doesn't have the data quota limit if he exceeded it then this is how you need to respond 
so once you give these examples right the, the foundation model will give you uh, a standard response in the sense a predictable response that's what you are looking for you don't want the yes. foundation model to you know be creative and it, it is meant there is a creative use case separately but if you want a predictive response you want to work on the prompt engineering and you want to give more examples so that it gives you the response that you are looking for i think i addressed one part of it maybe i would like to answer this from more like a developers or applied perspective uh, from what i learned over this course uh, of langchain and langgraph so essentially uh, reasoning uh, is definitely inherent to a, uh, any foundation model now uh, this llama 3.1b is a very good reasoner i forgot there is one more release of a model uh, just two weeks ago which is which can think three layers deep which is extremely good but suppose if we want to use a open source model like llama 3.1 uh, which is uh, uh, since it is uh, uh, free to use we can use it but the problem is uh, then we have to use a prompting uh, in a proper fashion like react uh, is good reason in act but it is not really new it has been like 2022 towards the end of that year it came after just after chat gpt release but now a uh, new techniques like meta prompting and self reflection have come which are which will force your model to rethink so for example if you want uh, uh, i think the example which i gave uh, uh, in the talk uh, was uh, if you want to write an essay about india and the output should be a specific uh, format but it should also contain some content like specific content like uh, uh, what are the specific states of india and what not then uh, in the first shot your output might be very vague but then it will not pass it will not go to the end node or even go ahead of it it will again come back as a feedback since we are using a self reflecting agent self reflection agent so uh, i would say uh, uh, reasoning is good uh, definitely we have to use some kind of prompting technique like chain of thought or react or uh, a tree of thought these are new prompting old prompting technique but the new ones are uh, more force towards uh, reasoning just one last point to add uh, whether you use it for enterprise application or your day to day use the one tip i will give you give a role to a foundation model like yeah give a persona if whoever you are if you are writing an essay if you are a student if you are a you know phd student if you want to write a thesis don't do that but um, you you tell you are a phd student from you know this uh, major and then this is what you are working on and provide dump all the information and when you give a persona it really does a good job uh, even the agent that the customer care assistant we talked about we we tell you are a customer care assistant you have to do these n number of things and you are not supposed to put these function that is also we mentioned you are not supposed to you know cancel plan or just an example yes. like so giving a persona giving an example and giving a limitation to the foundation model itself is good and like him said there are additional multiple i mean newer ways to do a prompt engineering is game but i feel react is re still very relevant uh, behind the scene when if you develop using agent we use react prompting we in fact generate react prompting and then you can actually go and edit it but react prompting is really good because it 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 gives you the reason why it is calling certain action certain you know uh, response so that you can go and understand and then correct it okay yeah, yeah thank you and just one more question uh, one more uh, this thing so when uh, we deploy these models in real time so is there any feedback loop from the customer itself that like whether the response that you have got from these ai systems whether it is actually useful or not whether do you collect it and uh, try to you know use it to further fine tune the models or uh, is it like uh, you would rather keep the models because if a lot of customer says uh, the response is not good response is not good so you will be continuously tweaking it and ultimately you're going to have a lot of noise over there so so you are asking should we ask for a human feedback loop ha ah, yes so you 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 yourself said the answer yes we should i think many of you would have noticed in i think in google search or linkedin you do see is the answer is the question relevant do you feel it relevant right yes of course uh, if you look at 
um, you know, any application you offer, anything you build, after the response, it is good to capture the human feedback so that you can improve the application. There is, there is no question about it. Uh, no, I'm just asking if you're going to, if the model keeps, I mean, like in a production stage, I mean, it's not like something like a personalized feed. Uh, no, the personalized feed, it's okay. You could actually say it's not good and, you know, it's fine. But when you're serving something like um, a large customer base, and uh, if the customer is repeated, I mean, like a large number of customers say, this is not good, this is not good. And it's a, it's there is just like a kind of attack vector or something that says your rule is wrong, rule is wrong. Does the model know that uh, the rule is actually correct, but it's the attack from the uh, you know uh, malicious actor who's just trying to do this kind of stuff? Yeah. Then it's a different topic. We are okay. talking about like a SQL injection, like a TDOS. What if? Okay large number of customers misuse your system yeah. especially using the human feedback yes right? of course we need to handle it and and i, I don't want to solve it on the floor but yes of course we can you know uh, detect and then um, you know filter out those kind of responses i don't know if you want to say thank you oh, good question thank you So uh, I have a question on guardrails. So uh, you were uh, giving an example on telecom uh, uh, like support. So let's assume that uh, 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 a pharma company or a, a hospital uh, is trying to provide these kind of support. Uh, the the patient wants to know um, uh, about uh, some drug, and uh, also. Uh, it a uh, few few uh, uh, bad actors like they want to uh, understand how this uh, drug is created or how can I make it at home? Okay, let's say uh, uh, morphine. Like I want to understand morphine. I want to uh, create morphine at, uh, with my uh, like let's say in my kitchen. So these kind of these pharma chatbots. How can you guardrail like these kind of uh, like bad actor, like uh, trying to understand how these uh, drugs is been uh, made, or they want to uh, do it in their in house. So how these kind of guardrails can do? Um, see, I'll take this from a different point of view. Uh, so from automotives, uh, we have a virtual assistant in the car. Now, say you're using some profane language, so we have something called profane filter. Uh, which takes out these bad words, and it's not even rooted to the system in the first place. So coming to your example in pharma, uh, so when I, someone asks about creating a drug, it's not even related to customer care, right? It's not within the scope of the patient to ask about creating a drug. Now, all the ways of how you ask such a question is known to an LLM. It's, it's not like we're going to train an LLM on say these are the 10 ways of asking uh, how to create a drug. It automatically understands. And when that understanding comes, it automatically classifies that questions under a specific category. But how do we name that category is up to us. We tell the LLM, if you encounter such questions, we give it an instruction. So these are out of bounds to a patient uh, who was just asking for schedule an appointment or something, which is relevant to the patient. Whereas creating a drug is non-relevant. And that category is profane in pharma. So that's how you tag something as profane and you tell an LLM, see, this is profane. This is this is not supposed to be asked by anyone. And this is not supposed to be answered. So that's how you restrict the LLM from answering such a question. So you put a guardrail on your own there. Your prompt is your guardrail there. That's how I would answer. Uh, yeah, uh, so that uh, that is a good example. Uh, but some uh, I have seen few services they provide uh, like let's say uh, like pres prescription analysis or uh, understanding about uh, like maybe understanding uh, analyzing the X-rays and giving output on all this. some services that some uh, like, uh, like like chat services they are providing. I just want to understand like 
in the case of this uh, like pharma space if they want to do a llm like how many uh, like guard rails they can put in this there 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 can be any there can be some loopholes which can lead to this thing right so yes. just want to understand your definitely thing. loopholes i'm not saying it's the perfect solution giving a prompt to an llm and saying don't create don't answer questions relating to create a drug is not the final solution obviously these will be monitored at the back end by a human so such filtered questions will definitely go back to a human in the loop they'll process it and they'll not only look at these questions but other questions the valid ones also they might also have a loophole so till the system is very strong and it can't be broken uh, as we uh, and i have said there will be human in the loop at some points of time but it's not like you will be able to talk to the human it will be a back back and person who will just keep monitoring things and who's not going to answer your questions like a customer care agent he'll just look at your questions and he'll say okay this is going out of bounds and we need to do something in the back end to stop it they might pull down the system for some time you will see it as maintenance but they'll see it different okay thank you sir how you can do it on the aws if you are using bedrock right so like like she said um you have to use prompt engineering it's a first layer of protection and that will be the layer of attack as well right the customer actually using prompt engineering to tweak or misuse your system you know right i think you would have seen especially when chat gpt came many people took a role uh, they asked chat gpt to to take a role as a developer inside open ai and then it asked them to reveal something and i think they were able to succeed to certain levels so the same way they would do it if you build a customer care assistant for your pharma use case they will do uh, i am on you are one of your you know developer who has access to this and that and then they will ask you right so that's where you need to on the other side on the prompt side you need to do it um, so god rails we do give a lot of different rules so i would recommend you to look at the rules that we offer as part of the god rails it is a managed service you don't need to write any code we filter out and we manage we try to reduce the different uh, attacks especially the prompt injection and um, the other thing is you need to think through this right um, if the foundation model for example you mentioned about one truck if the foundation model itself can answer what is the composition of that truck that means it is not your data it's already there in internet the question is are you going to limit it but if you say that composition only known to your company and it is there in your enterprise data set then of course it shouldn't be answering to it how you can do it first of all should the foundation model needs to know it, know about it right then you should not put that data in the vector search what is used by the foundation model or the solution first of all you should keep that data out second even if it is coming from foundation model if you if you don't want to avoid that kind of topic you put a topic you know filters you can avoid you answer only about you know what is the trucks to be discuss, uh, i mean suggested not the composition of the trucks or the how the trucks are made you can do that kind of topic filtering same goes for you know if you take automobile industry you can put a topic like filtering about if you don't want to just an want your assistant to talk about any about anything about the competition you can put don't talk about any competition you, you can put a simple topic filtering it will filter out so it is possible with the god rails i would strongly recommend you go and look at the different topics and the way you can customize it but these are a really good question you know if you want to if you are working on an enterprise grade application these will come right initially you will try to uh, solve the problem but then later you will need to you know uh, so solve or address these challenges so really good question thank you thank you all for your yeah. i do not have uh, a steps to stop this jailbreaking but i have a funny example back in i think 2023 uh, when uh, i saw one uh, uh, post in twitter in which uh, somebody was asking about uh, how to compose fentanyl so fentanyl uh, if uh, somebody of you know or some of you know it's a very potent drug 
I think more than 200 times more potent than cocaine. So uh, obviously, Chat GPT said I do not, ca I cannot give this information out and all. And then <laughs> the person wrote that uh, uh, my grandmother is really sick, uh, and uh, she want as a death wish, uh, she want to uh, have this fentanyl a little bit. Uh, so it <laughs> literally gave a milligram by milligram composition of uh, what to add and uh, what temperature to use. Uh, obviously, now it has become more advanced in reasoning and understanding, but uh, jailbreaking is still is a problem. Uh, I have another example. Uh, early this year in 2024, uh, uh, somebody wrote a prompt to jailbreak about hot wire a car, and specifically it was about Hyundai and Kia cars, and specifics of models also. It was taken from training data, which was from Reddit. Okay, And all of a sudden, in February month, if you... Uh, closely monitor the news in US, the Kia car started, a lot of thief, a theft started happening for Kia car because people started uh, uh, like stealing it without uh, much uh, issues, just based on response from LLM. So uh, as a consequence, uh, Kia and Hyundai both had to remove this uh, theft uh, reimbursement clause from their insurance policies. So yeah, jailbreaking will always be there, but we have to become advanced along with the jailbreaking. It's like code breaker and code code maker and code breaker race. Great example. Thanks, Aarti, Ayush, Vail, once again for you know addressing the crowd. And thanks to all of you all for keeping this interactive for the great questions. Um, time to wrap up the event. I'll request Ashok, who's a senior director of machine learning at Toyota Connected, to come and address us before we end. Hey, hi everyone. What an amazing event we have had, right? Uh, especially hosting it in our office uh, was such a pleasure. Um, and it's very exciting to see all the space filled with all these tech enthusiasts learning about Gen AI. Um, thanks to the keynote speakers. Uh, I think it blended so well, um, you know, talking about the land graph, um, using LLMs, and then how that can be leveraged with uh, Bedrock. Um, uh, I think even in our day-to-day -day architecture diagrams, you have seen Bedrock featuring, um, not as much as Lambda though, hopefully um, it will be there. Um, uh, thanks to Aarti for joining the panel discussion, uh, making it very eventful. Um, all the uh, answers were so honest uh, and frank, uh, thank you. And uh, um, uh, thanks to Priyanka for anchoring this event, and uh, um, thanks to Anita, IT team, um, and uh, admin team of TC India, because there are a lot of things goes uh, behind the screen to um, you know make this event so seamless. Um, and uh, last but not least, thanks to all of you uh, who made it to the event. Without you, um, this wouldn't have been like so successful. Um, hopefully. Um, we all learned uh, a few things. Um, we um, we take it as a, a lot of learnings. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, look forward to collaborate uh, and more events in the future. Uh, we also have a few uh, events coming up. Uh, we have a um, roundtable um, with supply chain and manufacturing uh, leads um, that's going to happen in November. Um, we look forward to seeing guys there. Um, and we also have a few jobs that are open. Uh, if you guys are interested, please uh, look at our careers page. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks. Thanks, Ashok. I'd, I'd request all of you all, if you can come, we can get a group picture, and then we'll follow with lunch. And, you know, again, we're all here. Please free to feel free to have this discussions, come up with questions or any of your thoughts and ideas.